Hey, everyone. So two quick things. First, my Facebook group page for The Suzanne Venker Show is back up. I'd been using that page for something else, but I have since moved it back to a private page just for listeners of The Suzanne Banker Show. I want a place where you all can talk with each other and where I can chime in periodically with questions and comments myself. So be aware that if you're itching to talk about the things you're hearing on this program, there is now a place to do that. Just go to facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Suzanne's group. And if for some reason that doesn't work, just try going to Facebook and typing in the Suzanne Banker show and hopefully it will come right up and then click on join. Okay. Secondly, when was the last time you took a hot second to write a review of this podcast? I get super sad when I check it periodically and no one's written anything in like a week. I just wanted to tell you how much those reviews mean to me and to the algorithms too. Pretty sure the more reviews there are, the more the show will appear in other people's um, feeds and whatnot. So if you think you'll forget, like I know I probably would, keep in mind you can pause this program right now and do it and you won't miss a thing when you come back. We'll still be here in the same spot. That's my favorite thing about podcasts. They're like DVR, which is so awesome. Okay, on with the show. From the magnificent Midwest, it's the Suzanne Venker Show, where men and women are equal in value, but wildly different by nature. Join us here every week as we challenge the culture's hugely flawed narratives about men, women, sex, and love. From coast to coast and from around the world, thank you for joining us. Hey, everyone. Welcome back. Um, I am going to read an email from someone. Actually, this was a message on Instagram. And I'm going to start doing this as I receive emails, which I do a lot. And I try to go through them. I've said this before. And sometimes I do those bonus episodes where I answer a handful at once. But I decided I'm just going to do my best to answer one each episode at the very least. So I'm going to start with that right now. This gal writes, hi, Suzanne. I just wanted to say thank you for all the advocating that you do. I found you on YouTube a few weeks ago, and I'm currently listening to How to Be a Woman When You've Been Groomed to Be a Man. I know that my parents meant well to raise me as to be successful and to find success myself without a man. However, as a 26 year old stay at home mom, I feel like I have let them down. I received my bachelor's degree in respiratory care and was a respiratory therapist for three years, all during the COVID outbreak. I had my son with my husband during the COVID surge in my area, forcing me to work four to five, 14 hour night shifts a week while watching my three month old during the day only allowing me to sleep two to three hours between my shifts. I was lucky enough to establish a great breastfeeding relationship with my son, but I do not remember a lot of that time in my life because of the sleep deprivation. After having my daughter earlier this year, my husband and I decided it was time for me to stay home and raise our children. I am so fortunate to have a husband who supports us financially and appreciates the work that I do at home. Although I have a bachelor's bachelor's degree, with no student debt, she adds, and I'm currently earning my master's degree online in business administration, I can't help but feel the constant disapproval, disappointment, sorry, from my parents. They have never outright told me of their disapproval, but they just try, they've just tried to steer me away from being at home and continue to work. Like I said, I have support from my husband and even my grandparents tell me how wise we were to make this decision. For a constant approval seeker, it's hard to feel that I've let my parents down. As a 26-year-old married stay-at-home mom of a two-year-old and an eight-month-old, I just had to tell you my appreciation that I have for all the educating and informing that you do. Well, first of all, thank you. I'm Thank you for saying that. I'm thrilled to hear that because that's why I do what I do. But I have to tell you, I'm, you know, when I read this kind of stuff, I get super passionate and upset <laughs> with the parents of this middle generation. So here's what I'm reading. She, well, she's 26. So she's on the lower end of millennials and possibly even on the cusp of Gen Z. I didn't look up where that is, but I know it's somewhere in there. She's 26. Yeah, she's 26. Um, so she probably has Gen X parents, which is my generation, but It's interesting. She's not the first person I've heard who've said 
something like this where the husband is supportive and then the grandparents are, which shows you the generational gap there. And that somewhere in the middle there, we have this generation that sold this idea of never depending on a man. And what I want to say to these young women who are doing the right thing and need support for that because they're not going to get it from their parents is that it's super important to understand that every message that you got from your parents comes from their own stories, their own stories. So when your parent feels really strongly about something and steers you into a different direction, almost always it's because it's reflecting back on something that they wish they had done differently themselves. And this can be really hard to separate for sure. But if you want to feel confident in what your choices are and what you're doing, especially when they're different from what your parents did or from what your parents told you to do, it's super important to understand why they're saying what they're saying, that they're not necessarily right when they're giving you advice. You have to dig into the why. Why are they saying that? What is their story? Um, why do they believe that? And, and get to the root of that before then letting whatever that message was affect you and the choices that you're making. So bottom line, you are doing the right thing. I am super sorry that you don't have the support. That's why I'm here doing what I do, because there just isn't enough support for doing the right thing and for putting family first. And so it makes me very sad. I can't even imagine having to contend with a parent, neither one of my parents, they're both gone now, but would have ever um, taught me to never depend on a man or to put my career first. So it's just, it's inconceivable for me. And that's coming from, by the way, a mother who was a stockbroker and had an MBA. Thank you very much. So my, it's a really super unique in that sense, because um, she was so different from the women in her day. And yet I still, you would think I would have gotten that message and I didn't. And so I'm very thankful for that and can't even imagine having to fight back against one's parents. So my heart goes out to you, but at any rate, I know a lot of people can relate to that. So I wanted to read that so that other people could hear um, and feel, hear other people's stories and feel not so alone. Okay. Today, um, I want to talk about money and specifically with the modern generation, you know, when you talk about how to live on less, that can be something that any generation can, you know, uh, glean something from, but I I'm focusing really on twenties and thirties, something, maybe even forties, just, just basically the modern generation and how different it is today, um, financially with, with the way we live. Because it's super difficult for a generation that has been raised the way young people have today in this one-click culture where every comfort and convenience is available to them, for them to realize just how much expendable money they actually have. Because they've never really had to live in any kind of bare bones way. And even their definition of what constitutes bare bones I guarantee you would be different from what it is, what it would be for those of us who are older and have maybe experienced life before the way it was today. And I'm going to get into the specifics in a moment, or especially our own parents or grandparents. So going back, um, generation, uh, I, for example, I was raised by, um, a mom who grew up during the great depression. So all of those, um, all of her, all of the things that she had to do and the mindset that she needed to adopt regarding finances came from that scarcity world. And she passed that on in her parenting. So um, it's, it's the, so much of this is about a mindset and about how you think about money, not so much how much you have in the bank. And that's what I'm trying to get across is it's really not about what you earn, but about what you do with what you do earn. For example, debt is a major, major, major problem today, way more so than when I was growing up. Debt is normal. Debt is what you do. If you don't have something, you borrow it. And my parents' day and the lessons that I was raised with, you save up and you wait. 
um, you, you're just, you, you don't, you don't, you don't take on debt, bottom line debt. We're just, it was just a very anti-debt family. So most people did share that view once upon a time, but it has been completely inculcated into the culture now where debt has just been normalized. That's one problem. Another problem of course, is social media and the constant FOMO that young people are having to deal with. FOMO stands for fear of missing out for those of you who don't know. And also YOLO, which is you only live once. And this mentality is the opposite of choosing to live with choices and trade-offs. Because if you are really certain about what you want, you accept the trade-offs. Of course, that's very easy to do if you don't live in a culture where you're constantly bombarded with all these images that young people are today in social media that makes it very hard to stay on track. So that mixed with debt are just two huge differences between the modern generation and those of us older folks who didn't have to contend with that. So my heart goes out to them. I can't imagine being exposed to that. I know for me, I would just have to be super disciplined and just get it out of my life because I wouldn't want it to be constantly in my face. So there are things you can do, obviously, but it's just harder. So I'm just, you know, recognizing that. Another aspect to this is that there's some idea that there's a certain amount of money you need to raise children. But the truth is children are as expensive as you make them. They do not need to be expensive. It's how you're choosing to live. They don't have to go to Disney World. Um, They don't even have to go to college and and get a college degree paid for by their parents, which is another thing that today is, I mean, that's great if you can, but I remember hearing growing up very clearly, (laughs) um, you know, you're not entitled to a college degree, you know, we get you through high school and then you're not entitled to anything after that. So that even though, um, they did end up saving and I did, was able to go debt free, there was this mentality that it wasn't owed to me and it wasn't an entitlement. I guess that's what I'm getting at. It's not an entitlement. And so people understood that if you can't afford it, then you work your way through it. That certainly she did. Uh, My mother in her day, she worked her way through. And there are other ways, but it's this idea that you have to save up, you know, $50,000 per kid isn't true. So that's another thing that the modern generation is having to contend with, with respect to uh, money and raising families. Okay, so in a moment, I'm going to go through a large list of things that you can do to live on less if that is truly your goal. I think that there are people who like the idea of living on less, and then there's people who actually are willing to do it, again, because of those trade-offs. Like I said, you just accept the trade-offs because you want this choice that you're going to make. And that could be whether it's more savings in the bank or the ability to be at home with your baby. That these things are you know, you're making a choice that this, this thing that you want is so important that it's worth anything they have to do. And they, you know, put it into action and make it happen. And then there's people who just sort of like the idea of it, but they're not really willing to do what needs to be done. But from my vantage point, what I'm seeing, particularly in coaching, but just in general with just general awareness and reading a lot and being aware of how things are for families today, people, individuals even, I really think at the end of the day, it's the lifestyle that's making things so expensive for people, not the one time large purchase, which, like I said, technically could be saved up for rather than put on credit if you're willing to wait. Um, But of course, a lot of people aren't willing to wait. So they're putting they're going into debt. And that's a problem, obviously. But in addition to debt, I really think the problem for the modern generation is that they want everything right now. They, th- they even think they should have wealth today rather than building wealth for tomorrow. Everything has been sped up, you know, as though there are hacks to get, and you see this on social media a lot, as though there, you can, um, there are hacks to get to the end zone faster, I should say, rather than the way our parents did. But those hacks aren't actually a method for building wealth. They just make people feel richer and like they're getting on the train. But Anything you try to do a shortcut for is not going to end well. 
So it's just this this right now mentality as opposed to building slowly over time and not thinking out into the future, but just living for today and tomorrow. And that's um, really going to cause a problem with your pocketbook if that's what your mentality is like. Okay. So now I'm going to go through a list of some of these things are just small and some of them are a little bigger. Okay. If we're talking about going from, for example, a two income to a one income and not, I mean, there's a lot of, as as I say, there's a lot of ways to live on less and it doesn't have to be talking about living on one income, but I'm just going to focus in on that. If you remove childcare, gas for commuting, takeout food, restaurants, and clothing, those things will be immediately erased from your budget when you're moving from a higher income to a lower income. So when you factor all of that in, you're not really looking at, you, you can't just look at the number that you're bringing in. This goes back to my point originally. It's not really what you're bringing in, but what you're doing with what you're bringing in. And when people get super serious about budgeting, because you have to budget in order to live on less, and presumably it's temporary that you're trying to live on less. I don't, I don't know. You might do it forever. It is very hard to get out of a mode, I think, once you develop that um, mindset for how to live on less. It's, it can be hard when you no longer have to, to kind of give that up and go hog wild. Um, some people just get really stuck in that zone of, I know that I, I do for sure. Um, so I'm thinking of myself here cause it's, it's just, I stay in that same mindset and I avoid lifestyle creep, which I think a lot of people struggle with. Um, that's another example of how living on less can be easier than you think if your mindset remains, um, or your mindset, I should say, doesn't change with the amount of money that you're bringing in within reason. I mean, obviously you're going to spend a little bit more if you have more, but maybe not, maybe not in any big way. And then that will help you be able to, um, continue to become, I don't know, wealthier, I guess you'd say, because you're not spending according to, um, how much money you have in the bank. But okay, so I'm 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 getting off track here. So from going from two incomes, for example, to one, those items immediately will be erased from the budget, therefore, thereby making you feel, if not richer, similar to the way you were when you had both incomes coming in, if that makes sense. And then of course, the biggest one, I'm convinced today that money is going out the door left and right because people are not eating at home. Over the past 20 years, I've noticed this massive social shift from, I mean, it's longer than 20 years really, but specifically it's like incrementally we have created a way to essentially never have to cook or never have to um, even make your own coffee, for example. You know, go back to the bags of coffee where you scooped it out and put it in the coffee maker, right? And added the water and blah, blah, blah. That's a, again, like I said, some of these things are going to sound small, but when you're talking about a daily lifestyle forevermore, it's not small. It's completely changing the way you're living financially because it's way more expensive. I remember when Keurig's first came about and my thought was, oh, I forget when that was 10, 15 years ago. And I'm like, oh my God, are we really going to do this? That's so wasteful. That's so expensive. And throw a few years in and then another few years and I'm a full on Keurig user. I mean, full on, like I don't even, and, and I justified it by, by saying, and this was actually true. I never drank a lot of the coffee that I made the last half of the pot because it was always burned. And so that's one of the reasons why I thought Kirk was so great. It's like getting a fresh cup of coffee all the time. So that alone was like this huge thing that was more expensive 
And if you can afford it, great. I'm not against anything anybody can afford, but I'm saying you don't have to live that way if you're trying to live on less. You can go back to the old way. And then when Starbucks became its thing, although that's kind of old news now too, but I'm thinking really in the last 20 years, I'm thinking about today compared to when I was home with the littles because in those days you're really pinching every penny and you definitely are doing more things at home. And of course there wasn't as much available anyway back then. And I'm, I've watched this incrementally and even like the Starbucks thing and buying coffee out that people do, which is so costly. Um, I'm thinking, okay, so we jumped from the bags of coffee to the Keurig to the Starbucks. So you don't even have to get your kitchen dirty ever, you know? And so these are the things that you, if you've only known that you, you assume, or you talk in such a way as though it's not possible to live on less because you don't realize that you're living the good life and you always have, but there's another cheaper way to go about getting that same thing. In this case, we're talking about coffee and that's go all the way back to the giant bag of ground coffee that will last you a month. If you do the work of actually scooping it out. You know, so this is just one example of the ways in which over the years, life has been made so easy for the modern generation. They've never experienced any other way. So when they say, well, I have to, uh, I can't, or I can't live on less because ABCD, they're not recognizing, which is the point of doing this episode, how many things they can actually, um, do differently in order to get more money in their budget. Okay. Um, going back to my list here, do your own cleaning and yard work. Now there are plenty of people who do this, of course, but that's just as an obvious example of, um, back in the day, having a housekeeper or a lawn person was not the norm. You know, that's something rich people did or something that you did when you were older and you could afford it, but young people do their own lawns, do their own cleaning, do their own cooking. I mean, that's just the way it is. It doesn't cost to do that thing, but the effort is saving you money. So that's one example you could cut back on cutting cable. Again, cable used to be way cheaper than it is now. We've added all the channels. We don't need all those channels. If you want to live on less, I mean, Again, some of these are going to be super small. I'm just going to go through and list cutting cable. That's just an obvious way to cut back. Not using credit cards if you cannot pay them faithfully each month. So cutting them up and just not even being tempted to use them unless you have enough money with how you're using it to pay it off each month faithfully. And this is hard for, I mean, for some people, um, even that's tricky because they might have enough, but the use of the credit card keeps you from being able to budget properly so that you will very easily spend in ways that you wouldn't otherwise, if you didn't have the credit card. And I can vouch for that having done it both ways. We don't have credit cards anymore, but we certainly did for many years. And I, I, I know this from experience. I mean, it's not about being a bad person. It's just human nature. It's just you, it's there. It just makes it easy. So don't make it easy for yourself. Make it hard. If you develop a scarcity mindset, even if you don't have to be scared, like if you keep a scarcity type mindset when you don't need to, you'd be surprised how much you can actually keep in the bank. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, okay. Subscriptions. Again, not something we dealt with 20 years ago, but I know that today there's hundreds of dollars going out every month for subscriptions. So cutting those and going through them with a fine tooth comb is an easy way to add to your um, attempt to live on less. When you have little ones, do free things. Do free things. Don't do things that cost so much money. I'm very fortunate my husband and I both for living in an area of the country. Um, we're in St. Louis 
I'm not sure I ever really mentioned that before. I say the Midwest, but I never say where. And one of the best things about St. Louis when you're raising a family, bar none, is the number of free things that are available to families. It's really remarkable. Um, so I could go all over the place and and spend very little to nothing when my kids were little. Um, if you don't live in a place like that, uh, move here. I'm <laughs> being funny. Um, just find things that are cheaper or don't cost a lot because um, – you just have to be creative at that stage of life. And um, the, the kids really don't care what you're doing as long as you're having fun and doing it with them, bottom line. So just do free as many free things as you can at that stage of life. Regardless of what how old your kids are, choose one extracurricular rather than two or three or four. That's a really obvious way of living on less. Again, going back to the way families used to do things, we didn't have all these extracurriculars. So the money wasn't going out the door. You don't, just because we've moved in that direction doesn't mean you have to follow suit. It just doesn't. It's harder. I, I'll, I'll concede that that is true, but you don't have to. So if your goal, if you have a specific goal, you have to accept the trade-off of that goal and not worry about what the people around you are doing, even if it's harder. Keep in mind, this is typically for a season if you're trying to live on less. You know, you don't necessarily, like I said, have to live on less for the rest of your life. Usually this is for a season when you're trying to accomplish something specific. And because lately we've, I've been talking so much about staying home and daycare and all that, that's what made me think of this because I'm trying to help people who want to be able to make it work and I'm giving you ways to do that. Uh, electronics. Oh my God. Yet another one. Don't buy so many electronics. You don't need that many electronics. You basically need, I don't know, a phone, a TV, a computer, and maybe not even all three, depending on what your lifestyle is like. I don't even look at our television, so I really don't care whether it's there or not. It just kind of depends on your lifestyle. Um, but you don't have to have three Apple Watches, two computers, 10 computers, 10 TVs, whatever. So electronics, that's another big one. Easy to cut back on. Um, driving used cars and keeping them driving used cars and keeping them it apparently has become a thing to buy new cars and very expensive cars and i realize i know what's happened with the car industry i don't live under a rock but if i were young and couldn't afford it or wanted to live on less and watch my pennies and actually we did do this for a long time is I'd always buy used cars and you know, we hold on to them for a fair amount of time. I actually feel guilty about the amount of time that I do. Cause I think it ends up being like six years and my parents day, they did it for like 10 years. So yearly you can do it for way longer. Um, but yeah, instead of the new cars and the loans and all of that, buy used cars and keep them around. Making gifts rather than buying them. I think that's a lost art anyway. Making them, whether it's, you know, baked goods or if you're able to sew or do things of that nature, if you're creative in that way, crafty or whatever you call it, make gifts rather than buy them. You don't have to go out and spend all kinds of money for gifts. Cutting out name brands and buying generic. I did that for years. I remember that. And one time my daughter got so mad, she's like, you know, she made fun of me or something and said, can't we ever have the real thing? I, it's been a long time, but I did do that for a long time. I just, especially, yeah, just buy generic. Uh, let's see here. Smaller, taking smaller and cheaper vacations every other year, let's say, rather than fancy vacations several times a year. Again, going back, people took vacations that where you piled in the car and maybe you went camping 
or you even you'd even go long distances in cars back in the day. Now that's all changed. And part of it, I'm I'm convinced again is social media because people have access to seeing other people who are living these very glamorous lives. I think even going abroad now has become sort of a staple for people, young people. They think it's just normal to go abroad all the time. I mean, very few people went abroad back in my day. I mean, that was for very unusual people. But again, you, when you're constantly seeing all of this, you you have this, well, first of all, you, you just want it because you see it. <laughs> so there's that. But then also you feel like you're missing out going back to the FOMO. But the reality is if you're going to choose to use social media and look at all of that and see that you, their story isn't your story. First of all, you don't even know if they can afford what they're doing. So let's just start with that. You have no idea. They could be up to bit up to, they could have debt up to their eyeballs to be able to be doing that. So that's one thing. Second of all, because you don't know what their story is, you're comparing apples to oranges. So all you have to do is stay focused on you and what your goal is and meet that goal. And if it's difficult for you, then turn it off. I mean, why wouldn't it be difficult? Turn it off. Turn off. The expectations are just through the roof for the modern generation. I'm again, convinced because of social media. I mean, it was already headed that way even before social media, the expectations, but now it's just off the charts. It makes it so hard to, to live on less when you're bombarded with all of that. Um, check your Amazon, especially if you do Amazon prime and all things delivery. If you're trying to live on less, you shouldn't have, be doing those things. It's just too easy to click and click and click and click. And then, Oh, all this money that you like, where's my money go? That's a great example of where it's going. These are ways that even though it's harder and yes, we didn't have to contend with this 20 years ago, regardless, you can live on less. You can. Going out for lunch instead of dinner, always cheaper at lunch. Ironing, ironing your shirts rather than taking them to the dry cleaner. If people even still do that, do people still go to the dry cleaner? I don't know. It's not the same way that it used to be. People's shirts are, I don't know, we have like wrinkle-free shirts that we hang up and don't tuck in. So I don't know. Anyway, I don't know if that's a thing for you, but if it is, that's one. Dry cleaning is very expensive. It doesn't have to be done though. Making your lunch instead of buying it out every day. Using cloth towels instead of so many paper towels. Having birthday parties at home rather than renting a place out. And canceling your gym membership and going walking or running instead. So those were, those are just the ones I could think of either that I've done myself in the past or that, um, are just sort of, you know, top of mind as far as what those things are that you can do to put more money in the bank and to live on less. It's really so much about lifestyle. And then of course, the other piece of that is debt. There's no question about that. If you have the mindset that debt is fine and harmless and good and normal, and you're constantly using it, you're going to always be spinning your wheels and never feeling like you're moving forward. So in addition to the lifestyle changes and all these little things that can be done, if you avoid the debt on top of doing these things, um, these, you know, making these seemingly small changes, I guarantee you, you will be living on less and you'll actually survive it <laughs> and see that, wow, I don't think I am any less happy because I'm living on less. I truly, I do really believe that. Um, also it's not a matter of, um, purposefully, uh, to go back to what I said originally, trying to live bare bones forever. It's just handling your money differently and still being able to get what you want, but going about it in a different way. And that's where the budgeting comes in and the saving up and not having to, um, be swayed by FOMO and YOLO and all of that. So anyway, 
that's all I got for today. I hope that's helpful and gives you ideas for those of you who are interested in living on less and trying to and wanting just some helpful tips. So that's all I got. See you guys next week. And that ends this hour of the Suzanne Venker show. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast and to leave us a review as well as share this episode with a friend. As always, you may reach me with any questions or comments at Suzanne at the Suzanne show.com. And if you would like to support this podcast, which would be very much appreciated, you can do so at patreon.com forward slash the Suzanne Venker show. Thanks everyone. Have a good week.